So, thank you. Let us now turn to our gospel reading for this morning. It is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. Listen again for God's word to you. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples <coughs> rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is a powerful story told in the award-winning 2019 film, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It tells of William Kim Kwamba, who was born in poverty in Malawi in 1987. In 2001, a terrible drought hit Malawi that was so bad that at the age of 13, William had to drop out of school to scavenge for food. He and his six sisters got one meal a day, and that meal was three swallows of what looked like some kind of gruel. Hungry, not just for food, but also hungry to learn, William spent time in the library, where his favorite subject was science. A picture he saw in a book about energy inspired him to go and take stuff he found in the junkyard, including an old bike, and turn it into a windmill for power. William was able to power a few small electrical appliances in his family's home, like the radio and a light bulb and even a cell phone battery. But that was only the beginning. Another wind turbine he built was able to pump water for irrigation. Local farmers became interested. Journalist True learned of his accomplishment, making William an international celebrity, a symbol of grit and inventiveness. In 2013, Time Magazine named him one of 30 people under 30 changing the world. He graduated the next year from Dartmouth College, his education having been supported entirely by scholarships. Since then, William has built a solar-powered water pump that supplies the first drinking water in his village and two other wind turbines, the tallest standing at 39 feet. He is planning two more, including one in his capital of Malawi. William explained that Malawi had plenty of wind, and that wind is what changed his life. Well, we are here this morning because of this same wind, the wind of the Spirit, that has changed our lives as well. And it all began on that first Pentecost, with the disciples locked away in the upper room. Jesus had just been crucified, and the disciples were afraid and scared. And that is when Jesus appears before them and says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he breathed on them, that breath, that other form of wind. And he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That breath, that wind, turned those disciples from a scared and confused group huddling in a dark room into a church that grew and spread and changed the world. That wind of the Spirit is the gift that Jesus promises the disciples over and over and over again. When Jesus is gone from the disciples' presence, he tells them that the Advocate, the Spirit, will come and lead them and fill them with all that they need to go forward. And here in the Gospel of John, 
he references the wind when he writes in chapter 3, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you know not where it comes from or where it goes. And that spirit seems to be a faithful, never-ending resource because it has continued to blow through the lives of God's people, claiming them, challenging them, sending them out, touching lives, generation after generation after generation, until we find ourselves here today in the part of God's church that is Green Acres Presbyterian Church. And we here know a little bit about wind, don't we? <laughs> right? We have lots of experience with wind, dealing with hurricanes and nor'easters. I mean, we've had plenty of wind this weekend. I was in Ohio on Wednesday in 80 degree weather, and I come here, and, and we've got a nor'easter, <laughs> which is, I'm sure, likely forcing a lot of folks to change their Memorial Day plans this weekend. Sometimes we have more wind than we can handle, right? Our weather patterns remind us that wind isn't always constructive. It can be destructive at times, even deadly. David Bennett writes, I must admit that I am not very fond of mighty winds. Growing up, I was always afraid of storms, he says, fearing that one would destroy my house. This might be because a tornado touched down about a mile from my house when I was a toddler. And I remember seeing the remains of houses as my parents drove by the storm damage. To me, that the Holy Spirit is called a mighty wind means that the experience of God's Spirit is not always going to be nice, orderly, or proper, as we tend to define these terms today in our church's culture, <coughs> and is, in fact, going to be scary and paradigm-shifting. That's what the disciples felt, and that's what we feel like sometimes, too. We do put ourselves at risk out there in the wind, because the wind of the Spirit is sure to shape you and me and our church in ways we don't expect and maybe don't even want. But I believe that the church stands at a unique place right now. We still have our structures that have powered us in the past, that have harvested the wind in order to nourish us and to nourish others. But in order for those structures to be more than just monuments to the past, we need to do more than just recirculate the air in our buildings. Our job as the church is to be windmills. It is to welcome the spirit, the wind of that spirit, and then to harvest the wind into radical hospitality and service. And we are doing that all the time here at Green Acres. We harvest the wind of the spirit when we welcome everyone, the stranger, children and youth, the outsiders and the lost into our midst. We harvest the wind when we make sandwiches and serve lunch at Oasis, when our dollars are collected for the Pentecost offering that supports our young people and inspires them to share their faith, their ideas, and their unique gifts with the church and the world, when we give food to those who come to our door or donations to the Hearst Shelter, when the music in this place lifts our hearts and the education helps us find our way back to the heart of God. We harvest the wind of the Spirit every time we live out our new mission of worshiping, serving, and growing with Christ-like love. Moses said in the text that Ray read, would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put God's own spirit on them. Fred Craddock, who is a, a great storyteller, tells this sort of parable. And he writes, 
I remember sitting in a little rural church on a Sunday night. It was a summer evening, so it was hot, and the window was open beside my pew. The minister was preaching on his favorite text, be not the first by whom the new is tired, because a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and it is better to be safe than sorry, because fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I was listening to him drone away when a man came by the church building and stopped by the window and said, psst, psst. I said, what is it? I'm listening to the sermon. He said, come with me. I said, where are you going? He said, I know where there is a pearl of great price that's more valuable than all the other pearls in the world. I said, there's no such thing. He said, in fact, where I am going, there is a treasure built, buried in a field. I said, you're kidding. He said, where I'm going, bums are invited to sit down at the king's table. I said, that's ridiculous. He said, in fact, they give great big parties for prodigals who come home. I said, that's stupid. Well, I listened to the rest of the sermon, and after it was over, I told the preacher about how I was disturbed and that I hoped it didn't upset him during the sermon. He said, who was that? I said, I don't know, telling me all this fancy stuff. He said, well, was he getting anybody? And I said, well, none of our crowd went, but I noticed he had about 12 with him. Friends, it's our job, our calling, to stand in the presence of the wind and to welcome the Spirit into our midst. Our job is not just to build windmills, it is to be windmills. Our vocation is to harvest the wind of the Spirit turning it into the courage to care and act for others, turning it into love that will overcome indifference and hate, finding in the wind the vision to power us into the future. Praise God that we are privileged, like William Kemwamba, to be in a place where there is plenty, plenty of wind to go around. May we welcome the Spirit and then harvest the wind as we welcome others, boldly saying, come as you are. So may it be for you and me, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.